Why, I'm Squidward. What kind of fool do you take me for? He's Squidward, he's Squidward, you're Squidward, I'm Squidward! Are there any other Squidwards I should know about? Meow. I'm out of here. Now, for all the confusion that goes on between which was Omegon and which was Alpharius, and who or what was where at what time, one thing is true. Somebody's dead. Hi, I'm Chrono the Harlequin, and welcome back to Live from the Black Library. I'm a bit like an Alpha Legionary myself, because I have a method to this channel, and even I'm not sure what it is. Now, this is a video I've actually wanted to make for a long, long time now. Initially, I was hoping for it to be a podcast with another YouTuber, but this channel has gone through a few revisions, if you haven't noticed. So, getting right to it, the whole mystery of what happened to Omegon really goes back all the way to the very beginning of the Legion. Because we need to clarify who is Alpharius and who is Omegon. And fact is, it's a little hard to tell which one goes by which name originally, but we can discern who is who very distinctly. Namely, the first one, whom we'll call Alpharius so that this video can even come close to comprehensibility, who was found the first by the Emperor, even before Horus, and was present during such events as the reintroduction of Horus to the Legions, and even the attempted palace coup by the head of the Arbides, one of the Primarchs, quote-unquote, of the Thunder Warriors named Ushatan, and Amr Astarte herself, the geneticist behind the Astarte program. He was there since the very, very beginning, since before the Unification Wars were even fully fucking over, but never revealed himself until all the other Primarchs had been found and the Great Crusade was well and truly underway, despite the fact that he had been leading his Legion for a long time up until that point, and had already spoken to his brothers without them knowing. Now, one thing I need to knock out here, a lot of people talk about the book Alpharius Head of the Hydra, where it states that Alpharius was found first, and he was there during the palace coup, and the calling of the Thunder Warriors, and the finding of Horus and all that, and say, hey, no, that's a lie, that's Alpharius narrating the book himself, how can you trust it? The thing is, Alpharius wouldn't know about the palace coup or the calling of the Thunder Warriors. No one did. It was kept very tightly under wraps, and that information was buried through the floor. The Primarchs never knew about that, because if they did, they would never trust the Emperor at all. Also, I know GW likes to fuck around, but they're not going to make an entire Primarch book just complete nonsense just to mess with us or for the sake of a mystique. If it's a book that substantial, a Primarch novel, you can at least trust that the very basis of it is true. And then there's the second twin, Omegon who was the one discovered far later during the Rangdan Xenocides, wherein they lent their aid to Lionel Johnson and his Dark Angels, not out of a sense of altruism, oh no, but because they had intelligence suggesting that the other half of their Primarch was located somewhere in the area. And he was. But even after they found him, they were still very careful to keep his existence under wraps until the right time. Yeah, you know that story we all hear about how, oh, Alpharius was found because a fleet of human ships attacked Horus's fleet, and Alpharius boarded the Vengeful Spirit and got all the way to the bridge before Horus recognized him and says, I found the lost Primarch and received him as his brother? Yeah, that happened, but it was entirely staged. It's here we can actually start to see the basis of how to distinguish them from each other, because even though they switch names, they do have distinct personalities somewhat. Now, there are a few commonalities. Both are very serious in nature, both are very secretive in nature, and both have no problem sacrificing anyone or anything in the aim of achieving their goals. And they are both phenomenally arrogant, and to my mind, display a lot of the traits you would expect of somebody with covert narcissism or vulnerable narcissism. And I'm not saying that as an, oh, you think highly of yourself and think other people are dumb, therefore you're a narcissist. No, I mean it in the sense that the confidence they have in their abilities, as well as this inability to perceive anyone as being on their level. They just assume inherently they're the smartest person in the room, and don't take too kindly to any slights toward that notion, 
really does smack of vulnerable narcissism in an actual clinical sense as opposed to the very Hollywood sense that gets thrown around a lot today where it's just analogous for bad guy. Now, the big difference between the two is the fact that one of them, the one that was found later, is a little more grandiose in his behavior. He's more outgoing. He presents himself more to people. He likes to look down his nose more. He's a little more outspoken in his dealings with others, while the one who was found first, likely as a product of his upbringing, is much more reserved, quiet, and tactical, even being able to keep secrets from the other twin. He's less of a doer and more of that hardcore schemer. He's also not really the one who uses the pale spear, because that was actually used by the one who was found later. It's something he found when he was out and about in the galaxy. Now, the question arises, who's dead? And to my belief, it's the one that was found later with the more grandiose personality who died. Because the way he tries to confront Dorn, talking to him as, Oh, brother, I'm here to grant you ultimate victory. I'm so smart. Haha. -ha, and then gets immediately killed because he couldn't even perceive. In his final moments, he couldn't even perceive that he had thought wrong and that he had been mistaken and that he was not the smartest person in the room and had gotten fucked for it. That was the original Omegon who was found a second, and to my mind, he's the one that's dead. Now, one thing I should keep in mind is there is literally a 50% chance I'm wrong here, but I also feel like it would be better if the one that was found later is the one that died, because that is such a cool character to have alive. The one who's a master infiltrator, who invented the Custodian Blood Games, and who was there through all of it, and was by the Emperor's side from the very beginning, and was always leading his legion. I think he's the more interesting character to keep alive, in my opinion. I think it would be a waste if he just died on Pluto and an offhand book. Now, one thing I should mention, in the end of Praetorian of Dorne, when one of the twins realizes the other has just died, and states, what I will say now will lock me in forever, the cruel joke has now become the reality, before going on to introduce himself with, I am Altharius to Horus. What that's really about, in my opinion, is the fact that he can only ever be Altharius now, he can no longer call himself Omegon properly, because you can't really keep the secret of one of the Primarch's death from the Legion, they'll find out. Now that that's out of the way, and we have a good idea of which twin is which, and which one I think is alive, let's talk about the end of the heresy, what we know so far at least, and the scouring, because these are the two big things. You see, early on in the heresy, for those who don't know, the Alpha Legion would be reached out to and contacted by a mysterious Xeno organization called the Cabal. They would do this through the usage of human operatives, namely John Grammaticus, who would go on to appear in the book Legion and guide Alpharius and the Alpha Legion towards the Cabal in order to show them what would happen now that Horus had been declared War Master and was going to tear apart the galaxy. Through a usage of something called the Acurity, they showed the coming civil war, and that if Horus won the civil war, he would feel guilt at his fall to chaos and what he had done, going on to tear apart the Imperium in a civil war that would lead to the extinction of humanity, but the ultimate death of chaos, as they would be starved of their main fuel, human thoughts and emotions. However, if Horus lost and the Emperor won, the Emperor would be grievously wounded, end up on the Golden Throne, and then lead to 10,000 years of stagnation before the ultimate victory of Chaos. The Alpha Legion would choose to side with Horus for this reason, but would only ever do so under the guise of wanting to uphold the Emperor's vision and his plans, because they believed the Emperor wanted the ultimate victory of humanity over Chaos, and what would be sacrificed wouldn't really be relevant in that goal. John Grammaticus, for his part, would go on to never appear in another book again. Now, the Alpha Legion would work alongside the Cabal for a while, going on to do such things as sabotaging the Raven Guard's plans to rebuild their forces during the Raptor Project at the Cabal's behest, but never truly being a part of their proper command structure and always being this unwieldy element. Eventually, the Cabal would be wiped out, and the Alpha Legion would ditch their plan. And, by the time of the End and the Death Volume 1, we know that the Alpha Legion higher-ups, likely the Living Primarch, would seek to activate sleeper agents they had on Terra, who had several trigger words coded into them, because the Alpha Legion is really big on hypno-coding, which would be used to guide those Legionaries, forcefully honestly, to whatever eventuality was deemed necessary by the Legion higher-ups. This could be side with Horus and take out the Emperor, side with the Emperor and take out Horus, 
or side against both of them and focus on chaos directly just what have you or try and like seize control of chaos just everything was planned for and what we know the final decision was by the higher ups even though we don't think it was properly implemented was called condition xenophon which stated that the alpha legion was to side with the emperor and to foil Horus's plans. Now, this wasn't properly implemented because the legionary who was sent to do so, Ingo Peck, a very important name to know in the Alpha Legion, was hijacked by Octe, who was a holy woman of the word bearers named Cyrene. Now, her story is a little bit long and complicated, but what you need to know is that she was a powerful psyker who read Ingo Peck's mind and then forced on him a code word called Orpheus, which meant to focus on chaos directly because she wanted to seize control of Chaos because she was like a lunatic and just deranged. Another Alpha Legionary named Matthias Herzog would be stopped by Ingo Peck, but Matthias Herzog was meant to implement Condition Xenophon. So we do know this, it wasn't just Ingo Peck acting on his own, the Alpha Legion had sided with the Emperor and were loyal at the end. Now, I'm sorry for this starting to run a little long, but I really feel like it's important information to clarify that whichever Primarch is still alive, be it Alpharius or Omegon, they are a loyalist, because the Legion would not move in this way without the express consent of their remaining Primarch. People actually had theories, you know, stating, oh, uh, Omegon turned against the Imperium because he was so distraught at Alpharius' death. Maybe he seemed loyalist before then, but he turned against them totally to try and avenge Alpharius, and because he was so disillusioned, that's why the Alpha Legion are traitors now. That theory was completely cratered by the end of the Death Volume 1. Now, we don't know where that storyline ends up, and we won't know until the next part comes out and the Siege of Terra is done, but for what we know now, Ingo Peck is immobilized below the Imperial Palace, those sleeper agents are still asleep, and for all we know, Alpharius slash Omegon is not in the solar system. They dipped out before the siege even began. So putting aside what we don't know, now we need to talk about the Scouring, and this is the big thing that always gets brought up. Namely, one specific incident called the Battle of Escrador. This battle supposedly occurred during the Great Scouring, wherein the Alpha Legion lured the Ultramarines into open conflict on the planet of Escrador, and began to ambush them repeatedly and used every underhanded tactic they had in the book to get the upper hand and keep whittling them down. Eventually though, Gilliman was able to corner Alpharius and kill him in single combat burning him on a funeral pyre, and getting ready to leave, assuming no Legion could survive the death of its Primarch, only to be countered by a redoubling of Alpha Legion efforts just as effective as before. So, disgusted with them, he goes into orbit and starts bombing the planet, believing to himself, no, this isn't going to kill them because there's so many places to hide, and listen, it's the Alpha Legion, I know I'm not going to get them. Sounds sick, right? Well, here's the thing. One of Alpharius's Primarch abilities, because he does have two main ones, is that if one of his underlings drinks his blood, they basically turn into a near physical clone of him. They look exactly the same, and you know, I know as an Alpha Legionary fan, that's kind of a joke, haha, they all look the same, but like really, really become an exact replica of him, even gaining a lot of their memories, and as such, the Primarchs will do this to someone before they send them on a suicide mission. So, I believe, along with many others, that it was a high-ranking Alpha Legionnaire who died in their Primarch's place on a suicide run. And yes, this has happened before in a different story called The Serpent Beneath, but I will talk about that one in a minute. Furthermore, you'd think, oh, Gilman would recognize his brother, he'd know, right? Well, he only recognized him on the surface amidst a haze of combat. And Gilman wouldn't know what it's like when a Primarch dies. He wasn't at Istvan V, he wasn't at the Siege of Terra, and he wasn't on Pluto. Anywhere a Primarch has died, Gilman has never been present. He hasn't seen that rush of spirit energy and the massive psychic backwash that occurs. Gilman simply wouldn't know. How could he know? The only other people who have witnessed a Primarch die would be Fulgrim, who isn't certainly going to give him the details, and Dorn, who kept Alpharius' death a secret, and, you know, that's why Gilman thought he killed Alpharius, despite the fact that he never knew there was a twin. He didn't know. 
Furthermore, the only book that this is accounted in is called The Index Astartes, which was a series of short stories and passages published in White Dwarf and then later collected and codified that sought to relay and explain the history of every Space Marine Legion. But it is stated in the one about the Alpha Legion in the Index Astartes that the Inquisitor who presented the information to the Council and to Terra and to the rest of the Inquisition was asked, hey, how do you know all this, by the way? Because we don't really have any records for this Battle of Escador, and the Ultramarines don't seem to have many records of it either. How do you know? And then he basically pulls a Dave Chappelle where he's like, uh, well, you know, basically knocks over the water and just runs. The guy disappeared and was later revealed to be an Alpha Legion plant. Now, the Index Astartes is like 20 years old at this point, and anything that old you can sort of start to cast doubt on. But, the Battle of Escador is mentioned again in a book called Sons of the Hydra from 2018, wherein a Lord of the Alpha Legion, Kizo Carthach, does claim to have been present at the Battle of Escador and witnessed the Primarch fall. He uses this as his justification for why he's so ruthless in persecuting and exterminating ultramarine chapters within the Galactic East. And remember, the big plot point of that book is the search by Loyalist Alpha Legion elements for Omegon, and they think they do find him, granted it's actually a shard of the Deceiver tricking Alpha Legion elements into doing its bidding, but still, the search continues by the end of the book. And it's very clear Alpha Legionaries themselves believe one of the twins to still be around. So there is a conflict onto whether or not there even was a Battle of Escador, but in the Alpha Legion fandom, nobody really takes the Battle of Escador seriously. I don't know any hardcore Alpha Legion fan or Alpha Legion theorist who genuinely believes both twins are dead. It is up for debate which one died and which one's still alive, but we're all in agreement somebody's still alive. And with all the Primarchs returning, it seems like pretty soon we're gonna get a glimpse. Now, this is all really well and good, but it really begs the question, why? Why would you hide this long? Why would you just vanish into thin fucking air when you could use your Legion as an effective tool to direct events in the galaxy? Where did you go with this? Well, the reasoning in my mind is simple. I do believe the Battle of Escador happened to a degree, and I do believe the purpose behind it was scattering the Legion, and I do believe Alpharius or Omegon faked his own death on Escador in order to let the Legion break apart under the guise of being defeated in some way, as opposed to just vanishing but still having everyone be paranoid about them as a unified body. The reason for this is because if the Legion remained unified, they would never stop being harassed and never stop being hunted and therefore could never properly direct events. Here's the thing though, in those intervening 10,000 years, a lot of Alpha Legionaries have, according to Sons of the Hydra, lost their way and genuinely turned to chaos. But make no mistake, and I've got a whole video about this, there are to this day no small amount of Loyalist Alpha Legion elements still around and we don't know the fate of all those Alpha Legionaries in stasis under the Imperial Palace. They could still be there for all we know. Now, in regards to Omegon in the 42nd millennium, or 31st, depending on what the calendar is like, it's a little bit messed up, look up the Chrono Strife, there are a few possibilities. And I actually did launch a poll about this on my Twitter, wherein I provided four options. The first being that he's dead, no. The second being that he is alive but in hiding. The third being that he is alive but has been active on the galactic stage covertly. And the fourth being one I will get into later. Now, according to the poll, there was a decent percentage of people who do believe that Omegon is dead. But again, I'm not convinced, and I don't think any of you guys probably are either. If you are, let me know in the comments below. I'm sure it won't start any arguments. So if he is alive, be it active or hiding, why? What would compel him to stay active and stay in the game and keep doing things, or lie in wait waiting for the right opportunity, especially with how things have gone and everything that happened and the death of his twin? Well, it would be because of his stated purpose from the very beginning. You see, when he was being brought up in the Imperial Palace as a baby, Malkador would tell him when they would meet, because Malkador was his primary tutor and instructor while they were playing Regicide and everything, that you are to be the secret shield, the sword in the darkness, the weapon our enemies do not expect because their focus will be on us. You will do what you must to preserve what we have built, even without instruction, 
even if and then Malkador just sort of trailed off. Now he didn't get the words out, but it's pretty obvious to all of us that what he was gonna say was, even if the Emperor and I are no longer here, which to a degree, they're not. Things like this are why Alpharius would take initiatives like siding with the Cabal, or even earlier on, inventing the blood games in the Imperial Palace by trying to assassinate the Emperor. Something he killed a custodian in the process of doing, mind you. That is the lengths he goes to, that is what he's prepared to do, and that's something that sticks with him through his characterization. If Omegon is still around, or is active, or isn't in stasis or anything, that's probably what he would be doing. Fulfilling that directive that was his ever since infancy, or quote-unquote infancy for a Primarch. But that again begs a question, why would Omegon let more than half of his legion, or the majority of his legion, fall to chaos and to treachery in his absence? It's even said by a new prominent lord in the Alpha Legion, Solomon Akura, leading the so-called Ghost Legion, that the original vision of the twins no longer matters, and that the Alpha Legion's purpose in the 40th millennium is to bring down the Imperium. Moreover, why would Omegon let the Imperial cult spread? He could have just been assassinating and taking out Imperial cult leaders left, right, and center, and keeping the Empire secular one way or another. Well, the thing is, Omegon had to play both sides, and he knew this. And this all comes to a head in a short story that Alpha Legion fans have gone nuts over and pondered over and picked over time and again, called The Serpent Beneath. Now, whenever this short story gets brought up, everyone draws attention to the fact that Omegon went behind Alpharius's back and thwarted whatever was going on for the sake of the Loyalist cause, thereby saying that Omegon is secretly a Loyalist and Alpharius is the traitor. That's why that theory has persisted so long, because of this one short story. What happens in The Serpent Beneath is that there is an installation in an asteroid called Tenebrae Installation, and in it, the Alpha Legion have built a disruptor station that blocks all astropathic communication from reaching the White Scars in their corner of the galaxy, thereby cutting them off. If you're wondering why it took the White Scars so long to find out about the heresy and get involved, that's the reason. The Alpha Legion was deliberately blinding them with the usage of this station. But the station would be destroyed by the Alpha Legion infiltrating itself so the White Scars could find out about the heresy and then journey to Prospero, then be confronted by Mortarion, and then decide to go Loyalist. How this worked was Omegon had sent a crack team, led by Sheed Ronco, their Terminator captain who often served as a body double for the Primarchs, and who had been given a wine glass of Omegon's blood so that he would become an exact replica of Omegon with all of Omegon's memories, including the meeting with the Cabal. Now, no one in the task force knew this was Sheed Ronco. They thought they were being led personally by the Primarch, so they were surprised when, at the end of the mission, he took off his helmet, revealed the effects had worn off and that it was Sheed Ronco, and that they were all in fact on a suicide mission and weren't going to be getting picked up, following by the station hurtling into a nearby star. Now, I know you might be sick of hearing this, but it begs the question, but why? Why even do that? What was so vital about this that you had to sacrifice your first captain and a friend and confidant for it? Well. In the book, it stated that, oh, there was a security breach that we needed to plug and the station had to be destroyed to ensure operational security. But what the fandom has interpreted it as is that it was destroyed so that the White Scars could leave the Chondak system and get involved in the heresy on the side of the Loyalists. But I don't think that's the case either. I think people have misread it. You see, in the very beginning of the short story, Omegon is speaking with a Psyker, a former librarian, who is at the installation and says, Hey, you know, it's really interesting. Being around these machines and this system has sort of made my psychic gifts become stronger. I'm becoming more clairvoyant. And Lord Primarch, I'm not, are we really on the right path here? I'm, I'm not so sure. He starts asking questions and starts gaining insight. And that's when Omegon decides he has to die. It's to ensure operational secrecy within the Legion and make sure nobody truly parses out what Alpharius and Omegon are really planning, um, other than just like a base level, because obviously the Legion does know about the Cabal, because they all say when they're asked, oh, we're doing this for the Emperor, we're doing this for the Emperor. But they don't really know the full scope of what Alpharius and Omegon are doing. 
And at the end of this, in the epilogue of this short story, Omegon goes back to his own quarters and says to himself, sort of hyping himself up, he's like, think, the third route, the third route, the third route. I feel like he's doing this to rationalize why he's lying to his twin, his one and only true confidant. Because he does lie to Alpharius. Alpharius doesn't know what happened. He doesn't even know the station is gone. Omegon says something in passing about a security breach or whatnot, or that, oh, it's been taken care of, yada yada, and then immediately goes to his room to hype himself up. Now, people have speculated on what Omegon meant when he talked about the quote-unquote third path, and I think I might know. See, the Cabal offered two separate paths, one being the Alpha Legion sides with Horus, and Chaos wins in the short term, but is destroyed in the long term, or one where they side with the Emperor, where the Emperor is taken down, Chaos loses in the short term, but wins in the long term around 10,000 years later. The Alpha Legion here is opting to play both sides, the third path. That's why Omegon was lying to Alpharius, because I believe these two have an agreement to split their efforts, Alpharius being the traitor, the public face, while Omegon still acting as a loyalist and weaving their way around each other. You have to remember, they're not just siblings. They are one soul in two separate bodies. They are literally the same being in a way. Although I have pointed out they do have a few differences, but it is stated over and over again, one soul, two bodies. In my mind, the only way they could not be on the same page or be doing things without the other's knowledge is if they agreed to do exactly that. And it really does sound to be very in character. This is why there were so many different encodings for those soldiers under Terra who had been placed there long, long before, because they didn't know in the end which way they would have to fall to maintain the third path. And yes, they did eventually opt to scrap the Cabal's plan, but that's nothing new to the Alpha Legion. Plans change in the middle of combat, how you execute it or even what the end goal might be. It's not anything new to them. And it's safe to say that the Alpha Legion had been plotting against the Cabal, or at least not directly in line with them, since more or less the beginning because this all happened before the events of the book Deliverance Lost, where the Alpha Legion would go on to sabotage the Raven Guard's rearmament efforts. Now, Deliverance Lost is woefully overlooked when people talk about things going on with the Alpha Legion, and I'm really not sure why, because a lot of big things get revealed here. First of all, we see that the Alpha Legion, by the end of the book, does finally break with the Cabal. What Alpharius does is basically take the Cabal's emissary that was with them, this floating gas orb alien thing, and basically tell it to screw off. The reason for this is telling, because they know that the Raven Guard are going to be on Kivar trying to rebuild their legion with genetic material from the Primarch project given to Korax by the Emperor. Now, what the Cabal wants them to do is simply destroy it outright, because the Cabal wants Alpharius and Omegon and the Alpha Legion in general to walk a thin line, making sure Horus wins, but that his grip when he does win is tenuous so that he's in a good position to immediately implode on himself. Though, the Alpha Legion doesn't exactly do this. As you likely know, what they end up doing is letting the Raven Guard get the genetic material, begin the project, sabotage the end results, and then make off with the genetic material and all the necessary research themselves. Alpharius is the one who orchestrates the plan to get the material and screw over the Raven Guard, yes, but what Omegon does is take that material and give false, faulty data to the Emperor's children and the War Master's court, which will result in significant losses for them whenever they try to use it. He explains this to that emissary of the Cabal. The agent of the Cabal complains about this, saying, you're being duplicitous. You're proud of yourself. There's something you're not telling me. And this Cabal agent is actually a supremely powerful empath that even Alpharius Omegon cannot block out. So when it keeps saying, there's something you're not telling me, we have it on good authority that no, they're not telling him everything. That's why he airlocks the thing. He takes it and just shoots it out of the airlock instead of just killing it so it can be respawned by the Cabal, thereby letting the Alpha Legion better pursue the third path. It's even stated in the book that the Alpha Legion walks a precarious line. Quote, As they had done so many times before, Alpharius and his legion had stepped upon a narrow path, playing a part to two opposing sides to achieve a third, more desirable outcome. One distraction, one wrong step, would see them utterly isolated and most likely destroyed. Again, we can see it time and again. One loyalist action, one treacherous action. 
action, reaction. Keep the white scars at bay, but then destroy the station and let them come through, also blocking out the guy who could possibly see through the whole haze. A very deliberate balance being struck. Everything really does come to a head though, in the book Praetorian of Dorne, wherein we see one of the twins finally die to Rogel Dorne in combat aboard the Battle of Pluto. Now, here during the Battle of Pluto, Alpharius, which I believe to be the second one in this case because they do switch back and forth. Actually, let me get into that for a second because I need to specify the first found one is not always Omegon, and the second found one is not always Alpharius. I know it can be confusing, but sometimes the first found one is also Alpharius. You can kind of tell though, because again, as I've stated, they have difference in personality. You see, the second found one is also more standoffish and aggressive with his brothers and more sure of himself, while the first found one is a little more reserved and actually cares about people more because he did grow up around people and actually has led normal civilian lives to an extent. We know this from Alpharius, Head of the Hydra, because in that book, he does for a time live as a normal human laborer, albeit a really physically big one, because he wasn't too huge yet, he was still young, and use that as a disguise to participate in the blood games. But he knows what it means to be a normal human, and as such is a little more humble, even though he is internally very arrogant. The second found one, though, he grew up completely alone and as such is maybe not as well adjusted. We can see this difference in two disagreements that Alpharius, quote unquote, had with his brother Primarchs at the conclusion of various campaigns. The first being against Gilliman, wherein Alpharius used his tactics of infiltration to bring down an entire town and a settlement and basically an entire planet, resulting in like 90% casualties for the defenders, while Gilliman said, hey, if you just did the more simple thing, you could have avoided all those casualties. This was, quote, a waste of the Emperor's bolt shells. Why didn't you just do the simple, logical thing? And Alpharius replies, that would have been too easy. It was the reason those two hate each other so much. Now, that doesn't really sound like the Alpharius who cares about civilian lives and has stated before that if we don't care about civilians, then there's no point to the Imperium. That kind of Alpharius, the first found one in my mind, is seen more in a disagreement Alpharius had with Dorne, wherein Alpharius used such tactics as assassinations to bring down a planetary government while Dorne wanted a full frontal assault. Dorne criticized him and says, hey, you could have still done the things you do by compromising their network, getting certain hives to rebel when, and utilizing your operatives in a different way while we attacked from the front, because how we win does matter. We need to show ourselves as actually beating them. But Alpharius said, no, how we win doesn't matter, it's just that we do win, and my method saved a lot more lives. We just had to do a few assassinations. It was easier that way. Those don't sound like the same Alpharius because, in my mind, they're not. That difference in perception does, again, to my mind, matter because, in regard to that relationship to Dorne, keep in mind, the Alpharius who was found first observed Dorne longer and had an ingrained hatred of him because he viewed him as incredibly arrogant, pompous, a potential liability to the Imperium, and never trusted him because, quote, how can you trust someone who never lies? That's why when Alpharius faces Dorne on Pluto and continually tries to convince him, we're actually on the same side, I'm here to bring you victory, and then ends up dying while he's running his mouth, I'm led to believe that that was the second one found because the original Alpharius wouldn't have been dumb enough to even try. It also deals with the subtlety in what is being said. Alpharius is trying to bring Dorne onto his side, wherein Omegon, the first one found, would be trying to convey to Dorne that, hey, I've actually always been on your side. Now, I know it would be really easy to write me off as reading too much into this, but when it comes to the Alpha Legion, and especially their Primarch, yeah, the devil really is in the details. It's after this point, during the book Slaves to Darkness, where Omegon, or an Alpha Legionary representative, brings um, a detailed map of the solar system's defenses to Horus, along with a dagger that was given to him, and then it just crushes it in front of him, basically signifying, we're out, you're on your own from this point. Now, at this point, for whatever reason, Omegon decided to side full loyalist, either it's out of maybe 
bitterness for the fact that his twin had died for this plan. Maybe he was just continuing on as best he could as he saw fit with the third path. Honestly, I'm not sure at this point if he even knew if the Cabal had been wiped out or not, especially since his method of contacting them was now floating somewhere in space. <laughs> there's, there's just so many minute details and little factors everywhere, but I think I've pieced together a comprehensive image of everything that happened and what Omegon's game was and just what the twins were doing the entire time. And of course, after this, we know how the heresy ends and we do know about the quote unquote battle at Esquador and the subsequent shattering of the Legion, a lot of them turning chaos, some of them still being loyal, some being heresy era marines just getting out of the warp now, read the book Shroud of Night, it's really good. Now, all of this wasn't just a 15 minute long tangent for no reason. I needed to explain everything that happened during the heresy in order to properly convey the mindset and character of Omegon and what he would be doing now based on where he had been. Walking that quote unquote third path and then eventually siding loyalist, as well as his methodology and his characterization to explain why I think he is doing what he's doing. He's almost certainly not dead. And if he's alive, he's not just in hiding doing nothing or waiting because he is active by nature. He is supposed to be the sword in the dark. I don't think he could truly sit idle by. Even if he's been operating at a lower capacity, I don't think he would just be not operating at all, just sort of sitting on his ass on the beach or somewhere. If he is alive and active and not under the guise of a character, then in my mind, he would be doing what he was doing back before he made himself known to the Imperium. Carrying out covert operations in order to weaken traitor elements and possibly blunt Black Crusades, as well as bolstering Loyalist elements, even if that means attacking a Loyalist world and killing loyal Imperial citizens in order to bring that world on alert, causing them to shore up their defenses in preparation for a larger threat that Omegon might know is coming. It must be stated, this is kind of what he was doing, well the opposite of what he was doing, back during the early stages of the Great Crusade, when his legion was still a secret. The Alpha Legion would go, soften up worlds before larger legions would arrive, so that they would be easier to take over. They would sow dissent, instigate rebellions, uh, kill off potential enemy leaders or anyone who could oppose the Imperium. They did this with the Imperial Fists on several occasions. They would go in, mess things up, get out, then the Fists would arrive to a world ripe for compliance. It would be classic Alpha Legion in the truest sense to facilitate from the shadows and make sure everything plays out the way it needs to, doing the best they can while not being seen. But how would he be doing that? How would he do that alone? Well, I don't think he would be alone. There are loyalist elements in the Alpha Legion we know about, but it stands to reason there would be ones we don't know about, especially since Omegon is the one who made off with the Primarch material and says at the end of Deliverance Lost, soon our Legion will truly be Legion. Everyone just seems to tacitly forget the fact that he made off with this valuable material that was given by the Emperor himself. I think he would use it to at least make some Marines to assist him on his conquests, or even more copies of himself. Who knows what he could do with it? It's Omegon. And now with old heresy groups like the Unsung making their way with a Psyker who serves as a mini Astronomicon through the warp, again, you really should read that book, it seems like things would be right to start coming together and for that Legion to start exposing itself, especially if they're going to act in opposition to Solomon Akura's traitorous Ghost Legion. Not to mention, people like the Redacted from the book Sons of the Hydra are still actively searching for him. I think that would probably be the most logical way to go about this, and likely the easiest, but to me somehow it just feels a little cheap for him to just go, oh, surprise, I was here all along and doing things, you just didn't see me. Yeah, it's likely, and it would make the most sense, but again, it just feels a little bit cheap. Maybe I personally am just over-invested in the Alpha Legion and Omegon storyline, but I think there is another theory that does hit a little closer even if it's a little further of a reach. That being he's disguised as current canon characters. In my mind, it could be one of two characters. The first being Cypher. And if you know about Omegon and the Alpha Legion community, you've likely heard this theory before about the mysterious fallen angel Cypher. The root of it is basically that the thing Cypher does can be explained when you factor in the possibility that he's Omegon. Namely, 
Cypher's actions are really hard to parse out because it seems like he fights in some instances for chaos, but in other instances, he seems to fight for the Imperium. It's really hard, like, he was the one who helped bring back Robute Gilliman, but he is also known as a traitor who has done some pretty awful things. The Dark Angels have been hunting him for 10,000 years straight. Wherever he is mentioned in the galaxy, they are sure to follow. And honestly, if I was Omegon pretending to be Cypher, that would be a really good way to direct the Legion's forces to places I know they should be, but I can't directly tell them they ought to be. It must also be noted that one of Omegon and Alpharius's Primarch abilities was to blend in. They could basically alter the way they are seen by other people, so that they either wouldn't be properly remembered or would be seen as someone else. They've used this ability to great effect to dupe people, to dupe marines, they were even a good enough disguise to get past Lionel Johnson, that sort of thing, and the other Primarchs. So it makes sense that they could maintain a disguise like that for 10,000 years. Plus, Omegon has lived in disguise for extended periods of time before, even as a mortal human back on Terra before the Imperial Palace was finished. So, if you're going to choose a disguise to live in for 10,000 years, what better disguise than one you would be familiar with? A solitary marine who's basically on the run anyway. It's the easiest, most natural disguise to slot into. It should also be noted that Alpharius Omegon are depicted as wielding a mastercrafted plasma pistol, and Cypher is known to wield a mastercrafted plasma pistol and an ancient pattern bolter, so that's just a little something there. Furthermore, if anyone was going to know about the existence of the Fallen, yeah, it's gonna be Omegon. And, during the fall of Caliban, remember, we don't know which happened first, the scattering of the Alpha Legion at Escador, or the fall of Caliban into the warp, there was chaos across the entire planet. It would be the perfect environment for someone like Omegon to slide in and steal someone's identity. And, the fact that Cypher has been seen across all four segmentums across the galaxy shows that he knows how to get around very stealthily. A very Omegon thing to do. It could also stand to reason why he's so intent on getting to Terra to quote-unquote see the Emperor, when in reality it could be to just get to the Imperial Palace to awaken those sleeper agents all the way back from during the siege. It should also be noted that the Watchers in the Dark, according to the short story of Dreadwing from the Horus Heresy, are stated to have some sort of greater purpose with regard to the defeat of Chaos. They know about Eldrad Ulthran even trying to warn Fulgrim. A lot of people have taken this to mean that somehow the Watchers in the Dark are related or associated with the Cabal. I don't think so, but still, there is something there that, like, there's this hidden connection that Omegon would have some kind of alignment with if he is actually Cypher. Another thing that gets cited is the nature of Cypher himself, and that's not just being the fact that he acts so sneaky and is this infiltrator and so slippery and you can't catch him. It's because a Dark Angel, I, I think it's um, Azariel, I think, comments that Cypher is hard to look at. He seems to weave in and out of vision, in and out of reality. Like, he's just almost incorporeal in a sense. And that does seem like almost a development or a growth of Omegon's abilities with regard to being hard to perceive and hard to truly recognize. Like, people will see him and not give him a second thought and just look away. Like, they don't realize they just looked at a fucking Primarch. Though there is a few big problems with this theory, despite how popular it is. One being, why would Omegon have such a connection to the Lion Sword? Why would it mean so much? Because Cypher has the Lion Sword on his back and never draws it. The other big problem with this theory comes from the fact that we've gotten more lore about who Cypher may be but since this theory has really cropped up. Namely, in The End and the Death, where we get a lot of banter between the Dark Angels, namely Zahariel, who is the new Lord Cypher, and Corswain. This is reiterated in the book Luther First of the Fallen, wherein, on Caliban, he sees Corswain and Zahariel in a duel to the death and remarks, only one of them will make it out alive, but he doesn't see which way it ends. And it's pretty safe to assume that whoever won that duel is probably the Cypher we see today, unless Omegon was waiting in the wings to backstab the winner and make off with the identity, which would be a little cheap. Two Dark Angels players, I mean. Because the Dark Angels have been getting more play as of late, I think they're going to have bigger roles in the 10th edition, wherein the Ultramarines had big roles in the 9th edition. 
So I feel like the reveal of Cypher as a character like Corswain or Zahariel is a given to sort of bolster that whole ongoing Dark Angel story with um, Luther's body being gone and the lion returning and what have you. It's a really cool theory, and people have stuck to it for quite some time. It does explain a lot of what Cypher's capable of, but I just don't think there's enough to really justify it, and I feel like GW is sort of steering us in this direction to Cypher being one or the other. So if it isn't Cypher, what other named character could Omegon realistically be? And it would have to be someone with some kind of reasoning behind it. You can't just go, oh, surprise, Dante was actually Omegon all the time, or Marcus Calgar was Omegon all the time. Like, could you imagine if they just, like, crack open Bjorn's Dreadnought and, aha, surprise? <laughs> well, no, actually. I think there's really only one person who fits the bill. And it's someone who people have caught on to and do suspect as it is, and I think would almost be too easy in a way, but is honestly just kind of perfect. That being... Alpharius. Now, I know what you're thinking, that's a lame joke, but... Alpharius as in, the marine named Deathro, who is a compatriot of the Inquisitor, Gregor Eisenhorn. Now, that might require a bit of explanation for anyone who hasn't read the Bequin books, or the previous Eisenhorn and Ravener books. I will try my best to explain without going too long, because I'm not sure if I want this video to break an hour long, but I think we might be headed in that direction. I'm sorry, everyone. Gregor Eisenhorn, the once Puritan Inquisitor, now turned radical Xanthite, and whose only really most consistent companion is a demon host, as well as a few other people from his past, but let's be honest, it's mostly the demon host we're here for, is working with an Alpha Legionary under the name of Alpharius. Simply put, a clone of one of his old compatriots named Beta, short for Beckwin because her name was Elizabeth Beckwin, is an extremely powerful psychic null, and is being pursued by the mysterious King in Yellow. She was actually groomed for his creation, to be one of his quote-unquote eight. He and the eight are actually the leaders of an organization called the Cognite, which is almost like the heretical version of the Inquisition. It's a big mess, but it's really interesting. And he's amassed many, many enemies in his ultimate goal. This includes several traitor legions, including the Alpha Legion, Word Bearers, Emperor's Children, Night Lords, and the Thousand Sons, as well as members of his own Cognite organization who have turned on him, and five Eldar craft worlds, as well as elements of the Ecclesiarchy, and several Inquisitors like Gregor Eisenhorn and his former pupil Gideon Ravener, just to name a few. It's bad enough to the point where there is a kill team composed of no less than a Dark Angel, an Iron Hand, a Raven Guard, an Iron Warrior, a Night Lord, and a Thousand Sun Sorcerer, all working against the King in Yellow. That's where this level is. That's how big this threat is. And if you're wondering what the King in Yellow's plans are, he's only just trying to get his hands on the Emperor's full name. Don't worry about it, it's no big deal. Because, as you know, in 40k, names have incredible power. To have the true name of a demon means you can give it true death, or control it. It's, it's nuts how much that matters and how much it doesn't really come up. So having the Emperor's name, giving you the power to control him, he who is now basically a god, could effectively tear the galaxy in sunder. The consequences of that are impossible to fathom. And at the end of the book, Bequin Penitent, we get a glimpse into what his name is. Not the Emperor's name, mind you, the King in Yellows. It is found in a book that contains the entirety of his name, the first being Constantin Valdor. Yes, that Constantin Valdor, Captain General of the Custodian Guard, who's been missing ever since the end of the heresy. Now, addressing that right away, there's a common theory, well, kinda common, I know I say that a lot, there's a common theory, there's a common theory, but when it comes to Omegon, all theories are fucking common, that the King in Yellow is actually Omegon, and Constantin Valdor's name is a red herring by him, or a disguise of sorts. I don't think that's true, because it does line up with what we see at the end of the short story, Two Metaphysical Blades, which deal with Lehman Russ's and Constantine Valdor's departures from the Imperium, as well as The End and the Death Volume 1, wherein Malkador has a vision of the future of the Emperor on the throne, other various dark possibilities, as well as, quote, Valdor driven mad. I do think he maybe has gone a little bit insane. <laughs> but that inclusion of Valdor 
does kind of click with Omegon, because Omegon in this tense, under the guise of an Alpha Legion Marine under the name Death Row, who's been working for Gregor Eisenhorn as part of his retinue, sort of a backbench part on the periphery, who's just been kind of working as muscle and as his eyes on the ground, not really doing much or saying much to reveal what he as a character is like, would be working for what he believes to be the Emperor's benefit. That is hard-coded into his programming, and we know custodians can't fall to chaos, so if they can't fall, no, what happened on the Vegetable Spirit does not count, that was possession of a sort, then Valdor is even more like that. It is in his nature to never be able to defy the Emperor. But with the Emperor's guidance and direct will gone, he has to interpret it himself. Doesn't that sound a hell of a lot like what Omegon would be doing, considering what Malkador told him his purpose was all the way back when he was just an infant? The sword in the dark? Preserve what we have built even if we are not here? Do so from the shadows if you have to? Hmm, very interesting. There is a very clear commonality between the two, and even though Eisenhorn is hell-bent on stopping the King in Yellow, I believe if Omegon is this Marine Death Row, then I believe he would be working with Eisenhorn, another person who is doing what he believes has to be done for the Imperium, despite the fact that it is heretical, remember Eisenhorn has a fucking demon host with him, as a means to get close to Valdor someone who would understand and that he could be on the same page with and has a deep history and connection with. Remember, they first met during the first ever Blood Games, wherein Alpharius almost successfully assassinated the Emperor and actually did outwit Valdor. There is so much going on here. It is such pandemonium, and there has been so many deeply laid plans that have been going for decades upon decades in this one little corner of the galaxy, and so many forces are converging all at once, doesn't it just seem like the kind of thing Omegon of all people would have his hand in? That kind of just has his name written on it. I don't think he's the ultimate architect, but I could totally see him having been a part of this in some way. There's just so much happening here. It must also be noted that the Eisenhorn books and the current Penitent book that's yet to come, which will finally bring it all home, Bequin Pandemonium, is written by Dan Abnett, the person who wrote Legion, the person who wrote The End and the Death Volume 1, the person who is responsible for the Alpha Legion in its current incarnation. Dan Abnett himself has said that it is honestly nuts what Black Library is letting him put in the coming Pandemonium book. Now, the first Beckwin book came out in 2012. Beckwin Penitent, the second one, came out in 2021. And Dan is going to be hard at work on the end in the death of volume 2, which is coming out sometime in 2024. Well, that's at least when we're going to get news about it. Who knows how long it could take, considering how much of a large undertaking it is. And then I think only then will we start getting more hints and more information and a possible release date for Bequin Pandemonium. And while recording this, actually, I just realized another thing. That being Omegon's infamous gray suit of armor. In the story, The Serpent Beneath, Omegon, after doing all that he's had to do and lying to his twin, goes to his quarters to steady himself and hype himself up about the third path and all that, and in his room is a second suit of armor that is all grey. Now, a lot of people at the time took this to mean that Omegon is going to become the mysterious Janus, the first Grandmaster of the Grey Knights, because everyone always wondered, hey, why is it Nathaniel Garrow the first Grandmaster of the Grey Knights? Why is it this Janus figure? We know now that Nathaniel Garrow dies, but that's a very recent development. And we now know who Janus is. He was actually the Loyalist Thousand Son, Revuel Arvida. Now, it may seem like a small thing, but you have to realize the Omegon was Janus theory was actually a pretty prominent one for quite some time before it really was debunked. Though, that grey suit of armor, something a lot of people just kind of dropped after the Janus thing as being a red herring or some dropped plot point or whatever, has in my mind resurfaced because of that character Death Row, that Alpha Legionary under a false name who introduces himself as Alpharius. Because Death Row is described as being one of the Warblind, someone who just lurks the back alleys of the city Elizabeth Beckwin is in, called Queen Mab. These people's brains have just been burned out by combat stims, and they're these former soldiers who just wander the back alleys in some feral society, and will basically attack anyone who gets too close to them, or their little world that they fashioned for themselves. And the leader of them all, the biggest and the baddest, is a space marine called Death Row, who wears unpainted grey armor. 
Now this would mean that Omegon A kept that unpainted gray armor for 10,000 years and has been in the city under this deep cover of a feral space marine for God knows how long. And for any other character in any other piece of fiction, I would say, no, that's way too much. That's too much of a reach. But this isn't just any character. This is Omegon. <laughs> now, do I fully ascribe to the death row is Omegon theory? I'm not sure. Again, I just can't parse it out. It seems like it would work, it seems like it would be cool, especially since the Eisenhorn series has been a huge mainstay since the, like, the earliest days of 40k, and is beloved and read by so many people. Eisen the first Eisenhorn book was my gateway into 40k novels, that was the first one I ever read, so I think it would be honestly awesome, but I'm just not sure. I don't think it would be in the sequel to a book like Shroud of Night, which some people seem to think, because that was a small novel on the periphery. Everyone who read it liked it, and it was great, but they wouldn't bring back a Primarch and have that huge of a lore bomb come out in a book that's mostly on the periphery that not everyone read. But everyone has their eyes on the Eisenhorn series and what's going on with Beckwin. Everybody talks about the King in Yellow and knows about it and has speculated about it, so it would be the perfect time to drop Omegon while nobody's looking, as a complete surprise since we have Valdor's name already on the table. It would be the ultimate rug pull. Now, let's weigh that against the other possibilities. That being Alpharius is dead, and I think I've said it before, no, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I've said it before because it's already been like a whole fucking hour and I've been recording this over the course of several days, would he be alive in the galaxy and inactive? That would just be cheap. Now, here's the thing. The other Primarchs who have been revealed have been inactive in the galaxy, like Lionel Johnson and Gilliman, but we have good reason for that. They were both either in stasis or asleep. Would he be alive in the galaxy but somehow active? For that, we would need some kind of hint, some kind of forewarning, or something to suggest that it is him that it has his imprint on it, some increased activity of the Alpha Legion aside from things on the periphery that we've only been seeing more recently. He as a character is such that he can't just be dumped on us out of nowhere, and again, I know that's what happened for Lionel Johnson and Gilliman, but they were brought out of stasis suddenly, and Primarchs who are in the Eye of Terror, they are in the Eye of Terror, we know what they're doing. We have a bead on them, so when they do show up, it's not this huge surprise that just comes out of nowhere. We know they are alive and in some capacity active. Even before Arcs of Omen, Angron was at the third battle for Armageddon, Fulgrim had his incident with Rylanor, uh, Magnus has been launching attacks against Fenris every now and again, he's still hurting about that, uh, Mortarion and Perturabo actually came to blows, and Lorgar has been sequestered on Sicaris, both in meditation and hiding from Korax. And if you look at the Loyalist Primarchs, Gilliman and Lion were asleep, Korax is in the Eye of Terror hunting Lorgar, Jagatai Khan is in the Webway, Vulcan we have the little something of his son searching for the artifacts to bring him back, and the fact that he's just generally a perpetual. It's only Dorne and Russ who we have basically no accounting for. They've entirely vanished, more or less. So for Omegon to return, there would need to be either some kind of books or some kind of evidence, something hyping it up, getting us ready for that, because it would be a huge deal, or he's already on the brink of coming back and we just don't know it, which would be pretty true to character's form, which would be, in my mind, in the form of Death Row. And now that I think about it, even if it's not Death Row, even if he's just some random Alpha Legionary, or even if he gets name dropped to be some important Alpha Legionnaire from back during the heresy like Ortolan Score or even Ingo Peck, then I think he would have retained some kind of connection to Omegon, and maybe at the end of Pandemonium, if Omegon doesn't come back, we could get some hinting at Omegon, something that could lead to that buildup where he might come back along the line. Like after all is said and done, and whatever's happened with the King in Yellow happens, that Alpha Legionary Death Row goes and says, Master, it is complete Hydra Dominatus, and then it's good work, my son, and then it just like hangs up or something like that. There is one more thing though, and that's being, what happens after Omegon is back, and say rejoins the Alpha Legion and starts leading Loyalist contingents more openly in a narrative sense? A lot of people are worried that might kind of kill it with the Alpha Legion, like they wouldn't be as interesting anymore. 
With a Legion like this, it's the mystery that makes them interesting. It's that are they or are they not factor, that constant questioning. But when you start adding more concrete elements like Omegon being a loyalist who is alive and active, it just gets harder to parse out. Well, I think it could be managed if done correctly. Namely, I feel like the coming Alpha Legion Civil War, something I've predicted, between elements led by people like Solomon Akura, purely traitorous elements, and people like Omegon on the other side, leading groups like the Redacted or the Unsung, would provide enough intrigue and lack of cohesion and constant questioning that would work to keep the Legion cool and interesting and the tricky bastards that we all know and love. They would still be unique because they would be the only Legion actively fighting itself and turning in on itself. Just it would be so confusing. You gotta remember, the Serpent Beneath is so good. It's one of the most interesting Alpha Legion stories I've ever read, and it literally deals with the Alpha Legion infiltrating itself. Having that on a full galactic wide scale in a like a total full narrative arc of that could be interesting as long as it doesn't overstay its welcome or get drawn out too much. But what do you guys think? I'm sorry for dragging you on on this bit of a slog of a video. I'm sorry, it got disjointed in parts. I kept doubling back to make sure things were clarified. Truly, this video is the essence of the Alpha Legion incarnate. But do you think Omegon is dead? And if anyone actually thinks that, please let me know. Do you think he is, you know, just those options I listed earlier, alive but hiding, alive but active, or named character? And if you do think he's a named character other than Cypher or Death Row, let me know, because there is probably something I missed. It's the fucking Alpha Legion. Or do you think he should come back at all? I know some people are just flatly sick of the Primarchs returning. I feel like maybe that's why GW is going to kind of speed run it and get it all out of the way, just rip off the Band-Aid. But do you think his coming back would add anything to the setting? Would it just muddy things? Would it kill the mystique and magic of the Alpha Legion as we know it to have him back? Please let me know. I want to hear what you guys think. Thank you so much for being so patient when this video was in production. It just kept getting longer and longer. I have never done a video that had to be researched this heavily, you know? The books I had to keep going back to and referencing were Alpharius Head of the Hydra, Legion, uh, Deliverance Lost, Praetorian of Dorne, The Serpent Beneath, Deathwing, Slaves to Darkness, Sons of the Hydra, Harrowmaster, A Shroud of Night, Bequin Penitent, and Bequin Pariah. Like, fuck, at least the End in the Death Volume 1 video was about just one book that I could hyper-focus on. This was insane. This was painful. <laughs> and with that, I will hopefully see you in the next much shorter video. Thank you, and I'll see you there.